Welcome to PhD with Women on It, Hack the Future. My name is Beata Young, and today's PhD, Positivity Hack Delivered, will be by our guest, Elaine Montilla. Today's title, Actions a Company Can Take to Retain Talent. Let me remind you, this is a grassroots community that focuses on women on IT, inclusive forum of women in technology, startups, female leaders who are supported by men as well. And I bring heart to that hustle because empathy is my mojo and empathy is critical when you are taking actions that you can keep the talent. So Elaine, um, where in the world are you today? I'm actually in New York right now. This is where I've lived for the past 20, 25, 26 years. I can't even remember. So diversity is the key to success when it comes to hiring the right people. And this statement rings even more true in the light of the current economic crisis. As you reported on your blog, over 140,000 women lost their jobs in mm. December in the wake of the pandemic. This is a highly disappropriate, uh, disproportionate number compared to their male counterparts. And you're, you're the founder of 5minority.com, a company and social media brand dedicated to empowering women and minorities, especially in technology, with a mission to demonstrate how businesses can be powerful platforms for social change. I mean, what would be the main question you would like to ask or, or suggestion you would like to suggest to companies that are looking for women and they claim, we've heard it so many times, I just can't find the right talent. I just can't find a woman. Hmm, that's a very good question. Um, there are so many different uh, actions that relate to that. And I want to start at the beginning. And it all starts with the group of people who are putting together the job description. Uh, believe it or not, the job descriptions make a woman apply for a job or not. And you probably know this. We are focused on helping each other, collaboration, and a lot of job descriptions use male words that actually turn off women from applying for a job. Um, so that's one of the things that I would recommend changing. And the second one, is that um, something else that I, that I know happens a lot is that our job descriptions are huge. Sometimes they're two and three pages long. And what happens is that a man will look at a job description and if he has, let's say only 40 or 50% of the qualifications, he would apply. But we men, we wanna have 100% of the qualifications and if we don't, we don't apply. And so what I wanna tell your audience, especially women, is that um, even if you have only 60% of the qualifications, just hit apply and go for it and see what happens. Um, the second part that I wanna mention is the hiring process, the interview process. I think we're disadvantaged. Uh, I don't know, Beata, if you've ever watched the show called The Voice, uh, it's blind auditions. And that's something that I wish we could do in the workplace is to remove all the names from the candidates because there is a lot of research that shows that we are disadvantaged when it comes to work, especially in IT. Um, it could be because your name is pronounced a certain way, because it shows your background, or because you're female. And uh, because of unconscious bias, sometimes when you read the resume without you even knowing, you give priority to a male, usually white male name over a female or a minority. And so a lot of those things are um, keeping us outside the workplace. Um, the last part that I want to mention is that we usually want to see role models. We want to see other women doing the work that we want to do. And we don't have a lot of that. And so we as women tend to think, well, if I don't see another woman, then maybe I won't make it. I won't get there. Uh, and the same happens for men who belong to minority groups where they would say, well, you know, I'm, I'm Latino. I don't really think I'll ever become a CIO. And so we need to give opportunities to women to make it to the C-suite so that we can encourage and demonstrate to others that it is possible. 
great. Um, I would like to also mention, 2nd of June, 1966, that's 55 years ago, NASA's lunar lander, Server 1, uh, lands in ocean, Florida, Carrier, ocean of storms on the moon, becoming the first US spacecraft to soft land on, on the moon. Mm -hmm. The previous uh, Ranger program sent craft that hard, had hard landings and its so-called so crash landings. However, the space, Soviet spacecraft Luna 9 claims the honor of being the first to soft land on the moon, almost exactly four months prior to Surveyor 1. No matter how many people or spacecrafts we send to the moon, we are still not able to have equity and we don't have diversity on the C-suite. And no matter who did the soft landing first, whether it was Russians, whether that was Americans, we know that there is no soft landing for women who enter technology field. Let me bring to you, to, to your attention, only 18%, 18% of undergraduate computer science degree and 26% of computing jobs are held by women. It's worse at the top of the corporate world. Just 5% of leadership positions in the technology industry are held by women. So what would you say, uh, Elaine, if you're a minority, I mean, you're, you've had it the hard way. What would you say <laughs> was the factor that made you going into that field? Mm, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, when I came to New York, and just so your audience would know, I was born and raised in the Dominican Republic. I moved to the US after finishing high school. So I was 16, 17, and I went straight into college. Uh, so I had to learn English. Uh, I took a lot of ESL courses and I love languages. So I had a, the advantage of finding it fun to learn a new language. Um, so when I went to college, I had to do what's called here a work study program, where you get a few hours designated for work while you're going to college. And I was assigned to the, the actually the computer lab. And I had so much fun uh, helping other people. Uh, my work included, you know, adding paper to printers, which I know a lot of my students do now, uh, changing toner and helping students working in a Word document or Excel. And I think that's where my love started for computers. On top of that, my oldest brother, Henry, um, he's into computers also. He's, he does web design. And I think watching him open a computer at home and change parts, uh, he would change fans and hard drives. Um, it got me really curious about what was possible. And I think my love started on the desktop support side because I wanted to help people. And then when I went into college, it transitioned into, okay, networking technology sounds very interesting. Let me see what you could do with a router. Let me see what you could do in the back end. Um, and all of that combined, and because I'm a very curious person, I like, I love learning uh, new technology. I was always curious about, okay, so HTML or C++, what can you do with programming? Uh, so I think my curiosity actually got me to to enter IT and stay in IT, which is not easy because it's really hard for women. Um, and one fact that I want to share is that research shows that 40% of women leave IT after 10 years because of the lack of support and mentorship. And so I, I think I was able to stay because I was able to receive that, that mentorship that a lot of women don't get today. Well, that's true, but not only that, uh, lots of women don't get the mentorship, they don't get the support they need, yep. but also women are 30% less likely to be considered for a hiring process than men, because these are the conclusions revealed by, uh, by a study titled are women less likely to get hired? Uh, written by Maria Jose Gonzalez. So down, uh, down dot, that route of uh, Latinas. And um, they uh, mm. researched um, at the Department of Political and Social Sciences. Uh, con it consisted of sending fictitious resumes, uh, resumes of uh, people between 37 and 39 years of age for 1,300 
70-something real job offers in Madrid and Barcelona. The CVs were sent in response to offers in 18 occupations. And then it turned out, in general terms, of the resumes, con uh, resumes considered, more than 5,600 male candidates were called to, called to interview in a higher proportion than women. That was 10. 0.9% versus 7.7%. So not only we are lowering our chances, as you said, Elaine, by not applying for jobs, because uh, it seems to be overwhelming. We don't really believe in ourselves. But also, once you send that resume, you're not going to be invited to the interview because you're a woman. So. I actually, Elaine, and maybe you have similar stories. I remember I was in Berlin uh, a couple of uh, years back uh, for a big conference, lots of people. It was a uh, uh, so-called um, Southwest uh, in Europe. Um, and I remember going to Zalando's offices. We were talking about bias and they had a brilliant panel consisting of um, you know, different gender, different backgrounds, and people with a different orientation. And they were talking about the blind uh, CVs and how progressive they are. But still, at the end of the conversation, I noticed something that was so obvious to me, but it didn't occur to the organizers, because at the end of the meeting, who was gathering all the dirty dishes. It was four women and one guy who was just pushing the trolley. So how do we fight that ingrained bias? Do we question ourselves? Is there a way you would uh, encourage people to think how to go outside of that thinking process? Mm, yeah, that's a good question. And I think as a woman, each of us can share maybe <laughs> five or 10 examples of similar things happening. You know, I've, I've had meetings with vendors that would come in and address one of my directors, who's a man, instead of me thinking that he's the CIO. Um, and so it happens a lot. And, uh, you know, for me personally, I've, I've entered into this, uh, I've evolved into this spiritual practice in the last few years. And I think that has changed the way I see myself and the way I see others. Um, it's, it's not easy because like, like you and I mentioned earlier, bias is unconscious most of the time. And so we're not even aware that we're doing it. Um, I know that training helps a lot. Um, I've done some research on bias training and I've read a lot of um, articles that talk about it. And one of the things that, that I read a lot is that as a company, you cannot just have bias training once for every employee and then forget about it. It needs to be consistent and it needs to happen every year because as humans, uh, a few months later, you forget everything that, that was shared. Um, a second thing that I would mention is that it needs to be included in the culture of the unit, of the department, of the company. And that would allow you to have constant reminders. So one example that I can give you is that if I have team meetings, um, I am mindful of the people who are speaking at the meeting. And if someone gets interrupted, I bring it up and I mention it. Uh, something else that I know a lot of companies are doing is creating these rules before a meeting starts so that everyone is in agreement. We will respect each other. We will allow our colleagues to finish their sentences, which I went through a lot at the beginning of my career where people would not allow me to finish what I was saying. Um, and then the last portion I would mention is that I noticed recently that a lot of companies are relying on mid-management to take care of all these issues. And issues start from the top. Issues start from the CIO. You cannot have bias training only for a few managers and not have the head of the company there. And so we should be leading by example. And it starts all the way at the top. And then it trickles down. And it needs to be reinforced. Because if you do it once a year, then you have the same problem the following year. Totally. 
I, I um, am mindful of the fact that Brad Jakeman, PepsiCo um, the CEO, fired a recruiter who was unable to find a, a you know, a slate of candidates for senior uh, management that was 50, 50 men and women. The recruiter said, I can't find women. So he had to hire and fire the recruiter rather than leave with that uh, answer. Uh, and Brad is saying, you need to have strategy for this. It won't happen on its own. I'm doing my best to drive diversity in the marketing organization at PepsiCo to drive disruption. If you can't address it at the source, it won't happen organically. This is a strong passion point for me because we cannot be disruptive if it's mm. the bunch of same type of people with the same background, the same education, the same socioeconomic groups, same gender and same sexual orientation sitting around trying to solve a problem. I guarantee you. That means me, uh, brings me to uh, a great quotation by Cindy Gallup. I'm not sure, Lane, whether you know Cindy Gallup. She's living in New York. Uh, hopefully, she's watching us. Maybe one day she will come to join the show and to be our guest. She talks about white men talking to white men about, about, uh, about other white men. And you can't really have a disruptive or decision making that is going to be different because it's going to be the same mindset, right? Yeah, and you know what else is happening? Um, and I talked about this uh, in my TEDx talk. You have recruiters who continue to recruit students from Ivy League schools and they completely leave out community colleges, uh, public schools, and so it's the same thing that you're saying. We keep giving the same answer because we are hiring the same people who are doing the same thing that we were doing before. Uh, I didn't hear about this this uh, this company, but I I am happy to see that that was the result. I'm going to fire this person and find someone who would give me the results that I need. Uh, and the same thing is happening with the hiring process. We keep going to the same places. Um, you know, I I belong to a lot of amazing groups and. I'll mention three of them that I know um, are working to, to make this change. Um, Latinas in tech, they have a lot of uh, people who will help a company find, you know, Latinos and women in tech uh, to fill their positions. Tribaja is another place that recently started uh, growing and giving good candidates. And Tequeria is a third one that I'm a member of. And, and so we need to get out of the comfort zone that we've been in, in for years and start looking at things with a new lens. We need to start looking into these different places. And, and I'm happy to hear the, the story that you shared because that's what it takes. It takes thinking outside of the box and not repeating what people were doing in the past. Because if you don't bring change, then everything will stay the same. And that's what's happening actually for women in tech. If you think about the way it was years ago, 15 years, 30 years, it's still the same today. Uh, why? Why is progress so slow? Uh, and it will take leaders like that to, to bring real change. Totally. I am mindful of the fact we've got lots of questions. Thank you, mm -hmm. Ika, for joining us. Another exciting episode from Women on IT. Um, and thank you, Agata, Czech, yes. Polish, and Elaine, I know. Your girlfriend is Polish, and you've been to Poland a couple of times. I'm Polish. I was born and raised in Poland. I, uh, I'm actually going uh, there soon. So lovely to see you, Agata. And uh, we have a question. Question comes from uh, Agata. What is the best way for a woman to get into IT if we didn't study at university? What would be your advice, Elaine? Mm -hmm. That's a very good question. Uh, and today is the best time to get into IT, just so you know, uh, because a lot of companies are changing the hiring process and looking at certification and technical degrees. Um, and so there are many, uh, places out there where you can do a boot camp. So I will start with that. What do you like? Try to find a boot camp if it's programming 
or CSM. Uh, and once you get your certification, a lot of companies will start looking into that instead of a university degree. You know, I started working in tech and I only had an associate degree and I started working as a health desk technician. Um, I got promoted within the company without getting my bachelor's degree because I started looking into certifications. And so what I did is I went for A+, plus. I was looking into Network+, plus. I got my PMP certification for project management. So take advantage of that. Um, there is more free content now than ever before. And so if you take a few of those courses and, you know, get into a boot camp and get a few certifications, that would definitely get you through the door. I would have to also uh, suggest that the boot camp idea is brilliant because not only you will learn, but also you have a chance to network. We had a meeting uh, nice. devoted to networking and it's are vitally important. We had also a, a brilliant uh, survey done with Kelly Howey, who was our guest um, uh, at episode 15. I encourage you all to check this episode on YouTube or Facebook or Twitch. And uh, we talked about the fact that sometimes we don't even think about the, that our network has a network and we can tap into that network by talking about the problems you have when you're trying new computer skills or whether you are trying to get into a job. There are so many facets and uh, I am really grateful for you, Elaine, to talk about it. We've got a question from Marianne Madeira. Thank you, Marianne, for joining in. Have you left a company and why? Let's just question mm -hmm. from Marianne, mm -hmm. if you could give an advice to them, what would it be? Yes, I love that question, Marianne, thank you so much. Uh, yes, I left the company, I don't want to say the name, <laughs> because I'm respectful, uh, I used to work at Wall Street, I think I lasted uh, nine or ten months, uh, it was in IT, it was a huge company, and what I realized was that I, I'm someone who craves knowledge and I love learning. And if I'm at a place where I don't feel that I'm learning, where I don't feel like there is value that's coming my way, then I get bored really fast. And what happened at this company is that I felt that everyone was learning from me, but I was not learning from anyone else. Um, and so I, I thought about it. Um, I, I stayed there for a few months. I waited. Um, I think it was a toxic environment. Uh, my, my supervisor was at times taking my ideas as if it was her ideas. And so that did not sit well with me. Uh, I'm a very transparent person and um, I don't mind giving credit when credit is due. Um, so one advice that I would give to them is to uh, spend more time focusing on professional development uh, and training for their employees because you want them to grow while they're there. You know, I'm, I'm not afraid of someone leaving my team. I'm, I'm secretly happy because I know I contributed to their growth. And training in my budget is one of my biggest items and uh, that's one of my priorities every year to make sure I have enough funds for training for my staff and so that's that's the advice that I would give that thank you for that question that's a tricky one uh, we've got mm -hmm. another one from Ika so um, she's uh, we are today gathered today to talk about actions a company can take to retain talent so Ika is asking in your experience, what do you think is the most common reason why employees leave and what is the best way to approach it as an employer? So to help you, whether you're employing dozens of women or men or whoever your talent is, let's see what Elaine has got for you prepared. <laughs> yes, very good. Uh, what do you think is the most common reason? Hmm. I'm going to say that most people leave their managers. They don't leave the company. And so you want to be mindful of the relationship that you have with your direct reports and the way they feel about you and your support. Another reason is the lack of support and mentorship. I think people like me at that company that I mentioned before, we want to grow. I mean, we want to learn and we want to contribute more 
to the company. And so I think in the end, it's a win-win for everyone. Uh, so the best way to approach it as an employer is don't wait for the annual review to talk to your staff. I think it's a constant conversation um, to find out how are they doing? And yes, during the annual review, create a plan for the following year and talk about their goals and talk about your expectations. But uh, don't wait for the year, you know, find out what's going on uh, every every week, every few weeks, every month. Uh, check in with them constantly. Uh, say thank you. Praise them in public. I think that's uh, another reason why people leave because they don't feel appreciated or because they don't feel like their voice matters and in, in, in they're contributing uh, to the team or to, or to the company. Agree. Uh, Agatha is thanking you. Thank you, Elaine. Great advice, whether we studied but not uh, or not IT um, or have not been to university. So uh, I hope, Agatha, you're going to be tapping into IT soon. Um, so we need you. About, yes, yes, we, we <laughs> fingers crossed. Um, I just made so many notes, Elaine. Uh, you're so full of quotations. I love it. <laughs> so um, you talk about uh, the leadership uh, role, how, diffi how difficult it is to lose touch with your employee. So maybe you could tell us what what was the most inspiring style in the leadership or or type of a leadership that you think is most successful in keeping the talent in the company, whether mm -hmm. it's in IT or beyond IT? Yeah, mm. if I could choose one only, I'm going to say emotional intelligence. Um, I don't think we give enough credit to emotional intelligence. Um, and for those of you who don't know, it's, it's the ability to, for example, enter a room and read the room. Uh, and I think that is crucial. It was crucial for me, especially knowing, you know, when to say what I wanted to say, when to keep a comment to myself. Um, and, and even while you're having a conversation in a meeting, knowing how other feel, how other people feel without them saying anything. Uh, I'm able to do that now because of emotional intelligence. I've actually taken a few training sessions. Don't think that I got all of this by myself. Um, but I think, you know, that and, and you know, being vulnerable. I, I always say that vulnerability is one of my superpowers. Um, I, I'm transparent and I want people to feel supported and I want people to understand that I am far from perfect. And I think a lot of leaders um, send their own message by only showing their achievements and, and when everything goes well. Uh, we're very imperfect and it's okay to say that. And so if I made a mistake, you will hear about it. Uh, and if you did, you will also hear about it because I want to talk to you about the lessons that, that came from it. Um, so I would say emotional intelligence and being vulnerable and just seeing others as human without all these titles that people want to attach to other people. Mm. Being vulnerable, that's actually quite interesting because I think the style at the moment that uh, we've ex uh, experienced so many for, for so many years is the style of a male, very strong, mm -hmm. uh, you know, superpower. There is no tears shed. And uh, I am afraid that this is the style that everybody is craving for. And you're talking about vulnerability, about your ex uh, talking about what went wrong. And I'm just wondering, isn't it going to be taken? You're not going to be taken advantage of if you're if you're showing your vulnerability. I mean, in a big corporate world, it looks like a doggy dog. So that's mm -hmm. a, um, I'm going to be devil's advocate and, and uh, talk about that. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's really good. I love it. I love it when we disagree. <laughs> um, you know what? I think that especially during the pandemic, we have come to realize that the old style and is the style that I'm trying to get rid of, of, you know, I'm in charge and you need to listen to what I'm saying. Um, it's not working. People are tired of it. Uh, I know my staff is tired of it, and that's why we've been together for 16 years now. 
Um, I think that uh, we want more compassion. People no longer want to have a double life, you know? Uh, you act a certain way outside of work, and then when you come into work, you have another persona, and you have to be a different person. I'm tired of that. I'm sure other people around me are tired of that. Um, by being vulnerable, by listening to my staff, I am not, not leading them, right? I am the leader. I am still uh, looking at the work that needs to be done. I'm still following up on the projects that need to be completed. All of the work that needs to be done is getting done. And in order for that to happen, I don't need to scream. I don't need to yell. I don't need to show them who the boss is. I think that is so outdated and it's one of the things that I'm hoping would change. And I think the, you know, the new generations uh, are aware of this and they're working very hard to show that this no longer works. And so I think this is the way of the future. And I, I'm, I'm excited that I'm, that I'm one of the first ones to do it. And I think that others can do it too. Brava, sister. I, uh, <laughs> I would love that too, <laughs> because that's, uh, that's definitely a uh, way more progressive style. But uh, we've been for so many years led by males, so maybe uh, they need to learn something from us women, caring about others, being nurturing, nurturing and also um, there is actually a study that uh, shows that emotional in intelligence is a strength of many females. We've got uh, quite a lot of comments. Agatha Bellon, I am going to hug the future women on IT. Thanks to you and Elaine. Thank you so much. I appreciate your comment. We have got also, also Connie Tan. We've never seen Connie. Lovely to see you. Um, Elaine is really mm. inspiring. Thank ah. you. Uh, there you go. Thank you so much for the many great insights. Thank you so much, Connie. That's really, really good of you to tell us and to uh, turn up. And uh, we hope we can answer your questions if you have some or just be with you tonight. I have to say that, Elaine, I often interview female executive CEOs. And I say I'd like to talk about to you about the experience of being a female business leader in what is still essentially a boys club. And usually the responses I get are, I don't view myself as a female or I'm just a CEO. And I wonder, I understand that for public consumption, people have to say that, but surely there is a difference. And what can be learned from female experiences in roles like that? We talked about emotional intelligence. We talked about the nurturing factor. What are the other factors that are very important for a company to succeed? Yeah, you know, you mentioned that I don't see myself as a woman. I'm just trying, I'm trying to think what that means. Um, I see myself as a woman very much, and I'm proud of bringing the nurturing and the collaboration and, and the love that I bring as a woman. I, I think that in the past we've been, we've been taught that those are negative traits that we need to hide. Um, and that cannot be farther from the truth. Um, you know, being a woman in tech, it's hard on its own, just that. Um, so for me, it was probably three or four times harder because I'm a Latina. And so when I first started in IT, I had a very heavy accent. Um, and I was actually quite ashamed of it at the beginning because I could notice people were like looking at my lips to understand the words that I was saying. Um, and so I had to overcome that. O also my curly hair, I, I, I grew up thinking that my hair needed to be straight because if not, people would look at me in a different way. And I'm also a member of the LGBTQ plus community. And so you could imagine put all of that together on one person. Uh, it was challenging and I think it still is. By the way, happy Pride to everyone watching uh, and celebrating. Um, it's, not, it's not easy. And you know what? One of the things that I learned as a woman is that we need to, we need to learn to be comfortable being uncomfortable. Because like you mentioned earlier, for years we've had an environment and a culture that was dominated by white male uh, norms. And so being a disruptor requires a lot of being uncomfortable everywhere you go because you're challenging the status quo. You're challenging what people are saying. And I think it all starts with just observing and asking questions. You know, I think sometimes we don't ask questions because we just want to go with the flow. 
the last person before me did this, so I'm going to do the same thing. No, okay, doesn't make sense. What's the value I get from it? My teams, how do they feel? Why don't I ask them? I think we make a lot of assumptions for, on behalf of our staff also. I'd rather ask them directly and see what they have to say. Um, and we also had many years where especially women are so concerned about being liked, you know? We spend, we waste a lot of time people pleasing. And so I think that the new change is just um, self-love, uh, understanding your value, and not being shy about sharing your accomplishments. And I think a lot of change in the company will come from that, but it's both ways. It, you know, I think a lot of women, there, there are traits and there is a lot of unconscious thinking that we need to overcome. And then on the other end, companies need to understand how valuable we are uh, and need to support us as well. Mm. Well, let's look at the numbers, Elaine. To say some, it may not seem like a big deal. Sure, these numbers are horror movie level frightening, and the tech industry is mostly made populated. So what? Look at that. 37 in 1993, uh, 2017, 24%. 2027 now predictions are showing that it's going to be 22 percent in malta where i am uh, at the moment in 2019 women in stem accounted for 2.7 percent in 2027 i am scared to even think about what the numbers might be well for one this mm. large gender gap in tech means our businesses aren't doing as well as they could be across all industries because women-led companies have historically performed three times better than those with male CEOs. This trend is true with startups too. The venture-backed companies that were acquired most often had 7% share of female execs as opposed to 3% at unaccessible, unacquired firms. Even the most valuable and innovative tech companies out there struggle with these gender-blind issues. Take the search engine behemoth, for example, Google has only 33% female workforce. At Facebook, it's even worse. The technical workforce is only 23% female. And I think there is a this concept of we don't like to brag or we've got the imposter syndrome or maybe I shouldn't talk about what I have achieved. And actually, I started a campaign, campaign uh, last uh, uh, Sunday, I think, or Monday, uh, on Monday, I started a campaign about bragging about your achievements. Very few women joined that and I want to do it every month. And I want us to be able to talk about the smallest achievements you've made. So, Elaine, what is your idea? How to brag about your achievements? Yeah, it's funny you mentioned that. You know, I, I notice that a lot. Uh, every time I get questions from an audience, mostly from women. And so I decided to write a blog about it uh, on how to become your biggest advocate. And what I learned, you know, especially for, for us, for Latinas, we were raised being told, be nice, sit quietly, don't raise your voice, um, and don't get too much attention on yourself. And so we carry that all the way till we are adults and in the workplace. And so I had to learn how to speak up and I had to learn, I had to unlearn all the things that I learned growing up, I'll say it differently. Um, and so I think that sometimes a lot of us are very shy. I used to be very shy uh, growing up. And we don't want to come off as someone who is showing off. And that's that's what I hear the most from women. Oh, my God, I don't want people to think I'm showing off. Um, and so we need to understand that if you are invisible, no one is going to promote you. No one is going to help you make it to the C-suite. to the C -suite. Uh, And so the only way to do that is to share your achievements as often as you can. Uh, and, you know, when I started in tech and I learned this, I would actually find key moments during a meeting with people above me to share a few of the projects that I have just completed. And it takes practice. 
because it feels very uncomfortable the first few times you do it. But I promise you, once you do it a few times, you just get used to it. Uh, but we just have to practice. Something that I that I share a lot is this this process of collecting evidence. And so what I've done for the past, I don't know, maybe six or seven years is I have a document online. In every accomplishment that I have, I write it down every year. And I recommend everyone listening right now to do the same thing because this is the document that you will use when you ask for a raise. Why are you asking for a raise? Well, let me look back. The past year, I've completed this many projects on time, under budget. I was recognized by this person. So you want to keep track of all of that and have it together so that you can use it. Um, also, when you have the annual review, you want to bring this document to your to your supervisor and share it and say, OK, the past year, let's go over my review. But let me share with you what I've done. Uh, and so I think that we have to just practice so that we can become comfortable. The same for LinkedIn. Uh, please, if you have a LinkedIn account, start sharing your accomplishments on LinkedIn. Uh, and I think that's easier because you don't see people in person. So maybe you start with LinkedIn and social media. And then once you're comfortable, you start doing it during meetings and in front of others. I think we work very hard. Um, and it is not showing off to let others know how smart we are, uh, how accomplished we are. I think uh, we are doing a disservice to ourselves. I'm doing a disservice to my mom by not showing to the world, you know, all the hard work that she went through to, to get me here. Uh, and how I'm planning to pay that forward. Well, she taught you to be quiet, so that's why you can blame her on that. <laughs> and I can I can also sympathize with you because I there was a saying in Poland that uh, you know the be shy, like sit in a cor corner, don't stand out, because, and you're gonna go further. But it doesn't work, unfortunately. Research by Women of Influence and, and Thompson Reuters reported that women cling to an outmoded assumption that their achievements will speak for themselves. Mm. Notice that the study said outmoded. Okay, in fact, the study found self-promotion to be the second biggest pitfall for women in business. So um, that's a very good idea, Elaine. I think I need to also keep track of my accomplishments, and no matter how small, because especially in, the, in times of crisis, uh, looking into this diary of awesomeness will be very useful for many of us and especially in times of COVID when we don't really go out and uh, we don't have this small social uh, gatherings using social media can be very helpful so um Elaine do you use any any part of uh, social media which which is your favorite I, I presume it's LinkedIn right and I we actually met on Facebook I know and we also follow each other on Instagram so I'm just curious which one is your favorite because you're very I would say I would see you and watch you on YouTube but I don't really see that many videos of you YouTube is my least favorite. You're you're so right. <laughs> uh, my favorite is LinkedIn, definitely. Uh, I like, um, you know, I like that LinkedIn allows you to be yourself. And you know, back in the days, you thought that LinkedIn was only work, and there was no way you would ever share anything personal. But I've seen that change in the past year, uh, and I'm happy about that. My second favorite will be Instagram. I spend a lot of time on Instagram uh, and then Twitter and Facebook. Uh, YouTube is not my favorite. I don't enjoy it much, even though I've been told you should create more videos. <laughs> there so you go. Maybe, maybe I'll work on that. In the next, maybe that's a goal for the next year to create more videos and do like a Q&A on YouTube. I'll think about it. I don't have enough time, but maybe I'll think about it. Well, I would encourage you to do that and maybe we can do a joint, uh, you know, women on it, uh, uh, five minority um, show together and I would welcome you um, to be part of it because I definitely see uh, that it would be very big hit. Uh, I love your infectious smile and I love the way you are so, um, so many um 
quotes I already made, I think it would be a big hit, Elaine. So you should consider that. I see I'll also the my list. Yes, so the ladies in the production are smiling <laughs> from ear to ear. So that's <laughs> that's definitely something to consider. So Elaine, I think um for me, I, I'm going to talk about my experience, how I felt sometimes. I feel like I'm fooling people by bragging about myself and sometimes, uh, you know, because English is not my native language, I find it difficult and sometimes I stutter and, um, you know, I'm scared as well. So what is your advice? How to overcome that fear of, uh, you know, not bragging about yourself, not promoting yourself? How to mm -hmm. tackle that challenge? Yeah, I can tell you what worked for me. Um, so I don't like making New Year's resolutions. Um, I, I never do that. What I do instead is I, I choose a word of the year. And so I have a bracelet. I don't have it with me right now. Um, I have a bracelet that I get from intent.com. And I select a word that would guide me every year through meditation. I meditate daily. And so I had a year where the word that came up during meditation for me was self-love. And I spent an entire, so I put self-love on my bracelet and I would look at it every day. And so I spent an entire year reading about self-love, understanding what self-love means. Um, and I think that prepared me to understand that I have so much value. I love myself so much. And I have so much value and the amount of contributions that I'm making to the world are so big that the world needs to see them. The world needs to hear about them. And I think a change in my mindset is what helped me with that because I no longer saw it as me, as me showing off. I saw it as me being a role model for the young girls that are coming behind me, for my nephews, uh, for all the girls that I mentor because I mentor a few of them. And so... I changed the way I saw it, and I saw it as me helping other women and contributing to their growth. And so I think that was the key for me, just knowing that, uh, you know, I'm smart, I'm important, and I love myself so much. I also write um, affirmations. I don't know if you're familiar with those. And so I would write affirmations in a notepad. Uh, I love myself so much. I'm, I'm smart. I am capable. Uh, and something else that I want to mention, we were talking about collecting evidence before. And I hear a lot of women dealing with what's called imposter syndrome. Some people say that doesn't exist, but I think a lot of people go through it. And so whenever you feel like you're doubting yourself, that is the perfect time to go to that notepad or go to that file on the computer and read your achievements. And it helps you deal with that imposter syndrome that, that, that tends to you know, come in every once in a while. Uh, so I think for me, it was just understanding the value that I'm giving to others. And it's a change in mindset and it takes a while. It doesn't happen overnight. Well, uh, I can tell you that uh, I think, Elaine, we have got already trolls. So that is definitely a proof of uh, your visit uh, on Women on IT uh, <laughs> channel. Very successful. The troll is suggesting we have uh, start having cute babies. But let's go to the more positive note from Agatha Bellon. We want more Q&A on Instagram and other channels with Beata and Elaine. Mm. What do you say to that, Elaine? <laughs> more Q&A. We can definitely work on that. <laughs> <laughs> we need to schedule it. Uh, we need to schedule it. Maybe we'll have a YouTube channel or something. We can definitely uh, talk about it. Thank you. Absolutely. So, uh, Elaine, let's move to what is happening in your world because I know you're ex you're working on the on on your blog. Um, what is happening in your world at the moment? Yes. Yeah, so I have a I have a goal. So I have goals every year, and uh, for this year, I really want to create um, a course, an online course. Uh, one of my signature talks is, is um, you know, how to thrive in a male-dominated environment. And I think that the content uh, is valuable and a lot of people are asking for it. So I want to create an online course so that I can 
have a bigger reach and people can see the content without waiting for me to speak somewhere. So that's one of my goals for this year. I also want to collaborate with other people like you and maybe create new content together. Uh, I am very busy because I'm also a CIO and so that takes most of my time and, and my team requires a lot of my attention. But writing in my blog, I also write for Forbes. Uh, I'm a council member in the technology group. Uh, and so I try to divide my time between all of that, but I'm really interested in, in creating this course. And so anyone out there that wants to help me, reach out. And how did you get that CIO uh, role? Mm, a lot of hard work. <laughs> a lot of hard work. Uh, especially, wow, especially as a woman and as a Latina, I always say that I always work three or four times harder than anyone next to me because I wanted to make sure uh, that people could see the value that I that I brought to them. Uh, I, I love education. I have always work and study at the same time. I got my associate degree while I was working full time, my bachelor's, my master's while I was working full time. And so I invest in myself a lot. I take a lot of courses. I read a lot of books. I love books. I listen to a lot of podcasts. And, you know, whenever I'm asked to deliver, I always want to deliver a little more. Um, I'm not talking about burned out. I, I focus on my well-being and that's a priority for me. But I'm very committed to, to the work that I do and I always want to give my best. Um, I am not perfect. And so if something is not OK, I'll, I'll, I'll think about it and, and try to find the lesson that came from it. But I, I know I know what I'm capable of and I believe in that. And so I think I think that's one of the reasons why I got promoted. I also got amazing mentors along the way that that helped me see myself at times things that I couldn't see myself. So I'm very grateful to them. Good. Well, uh, we are encouraged that uh, we should bring this home with that Polish Latin rhythm. Uh, and uh, I am actually mindful of the fact that um, you talk about delivering a little bit more and quite often in the corporate world, what that means is you have to work extra hours, you have to work 24 seven, how to set the boundaries. We talked about the boundaries uh, two weeks ago with Liesl Hayes. What is your um, approach to how to set the boundaries, how to say, well, I can't do that much? Yeah, uh, I, I in my blog, you will find a, a, an article, uh, how I recover from being a perfectionist, because at the beginning, I wanted to please everyone and I wanted to say yes. And so I learned the power of no. I learned that no is a complete sentence and there is no need to say anything after that. The other thing that I do now is that I organize my time well and my day starts the day before. So every day before I go to sleep, I look at the day and I know exactly what I need to do. I know, okay, these are my top three priorities. And then on Fridays, I look at the following week in advance. And so I'm not overworking myself. I'm not working till 11 or 12 midnight. There are days when, you know, that is needed in my role and I need to work after hours and, and that's okay because I, that's it comes with the responsibility. But this is not something that I do every day. This is not something that I want my staff to do every day. Uh, just to give you an example, during the pandemic, I had managers email me at 11 p.m. and I would tell them, what are you doing? Just stop doing that. There is no need for you to do that. Uh, so it's not only for myself, I, I want everyone around me to understand that we could do what we need to do with the allotted time that we have. We could have boundaries and say no. One of the tips that I share with my mentees often is that, you know, if you have a list of responsibilities or, or projects and your boss wants to give you two new ones, um, just bring that list to your boss and say, which one do you want me to remove? You want me to add this too? Which one should I move down the list? And so it, it all goes back to what you were saying, setting boundaries, knowing when to say no. And if you're saying yes to something, then knowing that you're saying no to something else and put the responsibility on them, not on you. Hmm. So um, let's imagine the less motivated um, woman in tech, if there is such a thing. Uh, let's say there is, there are people who are maybe struggling with work. What would be your approach as a CIO, how to really tackle that challenge of bringing everybody at the same level um, and at the same speed with tasks? 
Hmm. With task, you know, I think this is an individual process. I, I wouldn't think of bringing everyone at the same level because we are all different human beings and we struggle with different things. So what I would do is sit down with the individual and listen. I think we spend a lot of time talking and I think we spend a lot of time making assumptions uh, and we need to spend more time listening. And so I would listen and try to find out by asking a lot of questions, what's going on? What is affecting you? Is there something I can do to help you? Is there a training that you need? Are you not comfortable with the task? And find out what's the problem on their end. And then create a plan for them. Do you need training? Okay, let's work on that. Do you need me to pair you with a senior staff person so that you can uh, learn more? Let's do that. Do you have a personal problem? Let's, let's find out. Uh, and so I think each individual is different and you would have to sit down with each one and find out what's going on, create a plan, follow up, meet with them again. Because what I see happening is that there is a problem. We talk about it. I want you to fix it and then I let you go. And if you don't fix it, I'm going to fire you. It doesn't work that way. Uh, so there is accountability. Let's make sure we meet every week or every month until the problem is resolved. Let's find out what's going on. And of course, if the problem is not resolved and you need to let someone go, then you do that. But but try first and find out what's going on before you get to that point. Very good advice. Thank you so much. Um, that's very useful. Whether you're, you've got female or male talent, you definitely mm -hmm. need to listen and to be um, present in your company, uh, emotionally uh, present. So we are coming back to the end of the show and our favorite questions. Erms uh, is uh, telling us, uh, uh, hi Elaine, great insights, thank you. I can see she's uh, making notes. I POV it in Patrick's opinion, another fabulous, uh, fabulous show, ladies, great insights from Elaine Montilla. So, Elaine, there is your time to give us your favorite life lesson quote. Can you share how that was relevant to you in your life? Yes, uh, this is an easy one for me. <laughs> um, so, I am a spiritual person and uh, Dr. Wayne Dyer is someone that I love. He, he sadly passed away a few years ago. And my favorite quote comes from him. So, I'll say it slow so that you can hear it. Uh, and it says, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. And I'll say it again. When you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. And it brings me back to that changing mindset. Um, we grew up in a society that has been telling us what to do and how to behave. And so I've been put into so many boxes and I realized that what society thinks a Latina could do is not real. I define that myself and I do it every day. Uh, what society thinks a woman can do is not real. Someone put that together. And so I want to define that for myself. And that's why that quote resonates with me so much because we as humans can pause and try to figure out what works for us instead of what your teachers want you to do, what your parents want you to do, what society wants you to do. Uh, you know, I only have one life, and so I'm going to take advantage of it. Very, very good. Thank you so much. And uh, that goes to Willie Nelson, who said, once you replace negative thoughts with positive ones, you'll start having positive results which goes in line with our positivity hack delivered. Uh, Elaine, um, and final question that always comes uh, because pandemic is not over yet, but we can daydream and think about where would you take uh, one person in the world and who it would be to have private breakfast with? Mm -hmm. Private breakfast. <laughs> Beautiful. Um, it would definitely have to be Eckhart Tolle, T-O-L-L-E. He's my number one spiritual teacher. Uh, uh, if, if you follow his work, uh, he wrote the book, The Power of Now and A New Earth. And uh, A New Earth completely changed my life. I would love to sit with Eckhart Tolle, probably in my backyard, having tea. 
and just talking about, you know, life and the pain body. He talks a lot about the pain body and uh, how to be more present, how to be more mindful um, and how to make sure that we observe and respond to everything that happens around us instead of react. Uh, and so I love his work. I love his books. A New Earth is, I call it my Bible. Uh, and so it would, it would, it would fill me with joy to be able to sit down with Eckhart Tolle one day. Fantastic. Well, uh, thank you so much for Elaine for all your great insights. I love them, and I'll definitely uh, have a life lesson uh, today with some of your great uh, suggestions how to make a list of things that you're proud of that you you achieved, and. Um, uh, Next week's achievement for me will be a talk with uh, our guest. Uh, this will be um, Marcos Bravo, who is going to talk about how to create captivating video content. Maybe, Elaine, we can see you and you can uh, take a lesson because definitely I would love to see you more on the screen. And I would like to really thank all our viewers today. That was Aika Pagio, Agata Bellon, Marianne Madera, Rombit, Connie Tan, Enz, and IPO Vit. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. And I would like to thank you, Elaine, for the fact that you had to travel and you had to prepare with me on Monday, straight after <laughs> arriving to you to, to New York. And a lesson today, I loved your quotation, a life lesson mm -hmm. quote, because it also goes uh, in, in line with Maya Angelou. If you don't like something, change it. If you mm -hmm. can't change it, change your attitude. Today is your day to hug the future women on it. Hug the positivity you want. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you.